Hello, welcome to today's presentation on visualization. My name is Brett Champion, and I'm the manager for the visualization team here at Wolfram Research. And we're going to be looking at some newer features in the Wolfram language with regard to visualization. And in particular, we're going to start with um, talking about scaling functions. And it, the scaling functions have been around in the system for a while, and we've recently been improving and expanding on them. And then we're going to look at a new visualization function called ternary list plot. And then we'll, time allowing, we'll look a little bit at using the new drop shadowing style in visualization, excuse me, in visualization functions. So typically for visualizations, the most common scale is just a normal linear scale. And after that, probably the next most common one is a log scale. And log scales show orders of magnitude on as the same visual distance. So 1 to 10, 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000, et cetera, all take up the same amount of space on a log scale. And we can see that in uh, this plot on the left, where we actually have in the y direction a log scale that is being labeled in two orders of magnitude at a time. So factors of 100 from 1 to 100 to uh, 10,000 to a million. And on the right-hand plot, we have a log scale along the x-axis, um, and it's going both above and below um, 1. So we're getting 10 and 100, and then 1 tenth and 1 hundredth, et cetera. And log scales are so important in various fields and in science that since version six, we've had built-in system symbols in the Wolfram language just for doing plots with log scales. So we have log plot and log linear plot, and those are the two that you see here. And then log log plot, which has a log axis on both of them, and list versions of them, and date list versions of them. And if we wanted to expand out, then that's a lot of functions that we have to add. And so what we did instead is we added an option to the visualization functions called scaling functions. And as I was saying, there's two reasons for adding the scaling functions option. The first is to avoid having to have log versions of everything. Um, you know, so for like plot 3D, you would potentially end up with a log linear log plot 3D and a log 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 plot 3D and a linear log log plot 3D and all the different combinatorial uh, ways of specifying whether you want each axis, each of the three axes in a plot 3D to be log or linear scaled. And the second reason is to allow more scaling functions, more ways of doing scales than just linear and log. And so here we have uh, two of the other built-in uh, scaling functions. Reverse, which just runs the axis backwards. So instead of increasing going from left to right or bottom to top, it increases going from top to bottom or right to left. Uh, so here we have a reversed y-axis on this plot. And you see 0 at the top, 10 at the bottom. And the other one is reciprocal, which you know, basically does what it sounds like. So it, it instead of plotting, um, you know, so it places one at one and two at one half and three at one third and so on. And so it expands out things a little bit around one and compresses things that are farther away from one. And so for several versions, these have been sort of the main built-in scaling functions that we've had, uh, log scales, uh, reverse, and reciprocal. And it, it's useful to think of, you know, there's sort of, of, of how scaling functions work. And there's two things that a scaling function does. One is that it does the actual transformation of the plot. And so here I have on the left, um, plot of an expression with scaling functions goes to log. 
And on the right, I'm plotting log of the function instead. And the curves look exactly the same in, in terms of where the blue line is relative to the box around it. And that's the first part of what scaling functions does is the actual transformation of the geometry of the primitives of the curves and lines and points and whatever. The second part of what scaling functions does is to then correct for that when we're looking at the axes and the ticks and that sort of thing. Um, so that we still have um, meaningful numbers that reflect back on the original plot um, along the axis so that it's easy to read. So four squared um, is 16 and you know some minor term for sine of X. Uh, and, and so if we trace up from four, we're up here at you know a little bit above 10. And you know, so this is 10, this is 20. So it's quite you know, reasonable that this is a value of 16. Whereas if we look at where we just manually applied log, we'd have to sort of mentally think of, okay, what is e to the two point something? And it's not nearly as nice to get back to um, whatever the actual, you know, that 16 value. Um, and, and, and so those are the two parts of scaling functions, the transformation going one direction and then correcting for it, sort of coming back the other direction so that your coordinates are still in nice things to talk about and to think about. Um, and most of the, so the scaling functions we looked at so far, log, reverse, reciprocal, these are all implemented using functions that are nice mappings from real numbers to real numbers, or relatively nice mappings from real numbers to real numbers. So log is transforming by just applying log to things, reverse is negating it, and reciprocal is taking the reciprocal. Um, and then those have you know, sort of inverse mappings that we get used, that get used to, account for the labeling and so for log it's going to be x and then conveniently for reverse and reciprocal it's just the same function again so negation and recip reciprocality are their own inverses and so it's the same function doing you know both bits of work and so scaling functions i think was originally introduced in version seven thereabouts and we've been rolling it out in pieces to more and more functions. And at this point where we have about 80% of the visualization functions support scaling functions. And so most recently, a lot of the vector plotting functions have picked up support for scaling functions and um, some of the parametric type plots, spherical revolution plot 3D, that sort of thing. And, and so that's been one you know, sort of big block of effort that doesn't necessarily, um, isn't fancy in itself, but if you need it you know, for one of these visualization functions, then it's there as a tool that you can use. Um, and the other thing that we've been doing to expand scaling functions is adding more built-in types of scaling functions. Um, and, and so we've added a signed log scaling function, which is able to, which is similar to log, except does a little bit of work so that we can deal with negative numbers and even zero. Um, and, and so it has to shift a traditional log scale a little bit to um, be able to show those. And then We've also added infinite scaling functions. And so these are actually used by default if you do a plot with infinite bounds on the variable. So plot of x, x goes from minus infinity to infinity. And in this case, the curve doesn't get all the way out because um, the automatic plot range calculation clips it at plus or minus 40-ish. Um, but you can see that the x scale 
includes minus infinity and it includes infinity and it's you know sort of there's there's a lot of you know range in here between minus 10 and minus infinity or between 10 and infinity compared to zero to 10 say um and, and there's some ways of controlling, you know, sort of how, you know, how much of a more linear scale you see in the middle here and how much is pushed out to the edges. Um, and like I said, this is done automatically if you have these variables, I mean, if you have these limits as infinite values, or you can specify it explicitly. Um, and so in this case, I'm doing the same plot except I'm saying that I also want the X act, I'm sorry, I also want the Y axis to be an infinite scale. And so then we have infinities on the Y axis and this, you know, our line has straightened back out into a line and the nonlinear transforms have sort of canceled each other out in this case. And it's, it's sort of an interesting question of, if you have an infinite domain, do you want an infinite range as well? And there's cases where you do, and there's cases where you don't. And so since we haven't figured out a good way of detect of determining when you want which case, at the mo moment you have to manually specify if you want that range to be an infinite scale as well. And so these are two of the more recent built-in scaling functions, they're still pretty much real number to real number type um, scales, uh, nothing too exotic there. So getting into the more exotic case, we are allowing dates to be used as scaling functions, to have date-based scaling functions. And, and so in the past, you know, again, since version six, we've had dateless plot and I think dateless log plot probably got introduced in about version seven. Um, but wanting to add support for dates and uh, for data with dates in it, again, we don't want date list plot 3D and date date contour plot or whatever. Um, and so scaling functions is you know sort of the best place to add that parameterization and allow that type of functionality. And so I'm going to show an example. And this is the, this is one of my favorite examples to recreate um, every few versions and see you know, if, if we've made it simpler to do over time. Um, and so this is plotting sunrise and sunset for Champaign, Illinois, where our company is headquartered and where I live. And um, plotting sunrise, sunset over the course of the year. And so I'm creating my data. Um, and so it's it looks like a date and a time when the sunrise is and I'm wrapping it in a time object to throw away the, um, I mean, normally sunrise would return this time on that date and that doesn't plot quite so well. And so I'm throwing away the date part of it and just reducing it to 8.15 AM. And so I have a year's worth of things like that. I have the same for my sunsets. And then I say list line plot of my rise and sets, and I'm setting my scaling functions to date on the x axis and date on the y axis. And so now I can see you know, sort of where the days are short and where they're long, and you know, sort of the interesting asymmetries and things. And admittedly, at the moment, this version isn't accounting for daylight saving time. It would be a little bit more work to um, correct for that in the um, construction here, and I wanted to keep it a little bit simpler. Um, and you know, even though this is time object instead of date object on the y-axis, it's still a date scale, and that's still the scaling function we're going to use for that. Um, 
And so then we started getting into really interesting uses of scaling function, which is what if we don't really restrict ourselves to um, um, continuous types of data and, and inputs. And so then we tackled categorical scales. And we have two types of categorical scales that we've added to the system, uh, nominal scales and ordinal scales. And there's really not a lot of difference between them in many ways. The difference between nominal scale and ordinal scale is nominal scale is just a collection of things. You can't say anything about it. So it might be people's names, it might be locations, it could be models of a car or um, companies in a city or um, offices in a company, um, types of fruit, you know, all these different types of things that you might have um, lying around as a named type of thing. And ordinal scale is very similar. And the difference is, is that with ordinal scale, you're saying that these are categorical things, but there is an ordering to them of some sort. So it could be things like letter grades in a class, A, B, C, D, E, F. It could be, you know, the different, the magnitude of a tornado. So the EF3 type stuff. Um, it could be credit ratings or um, if, if you go to the doctor and they ask you, you know, what your level of pain is, they typically have like a 10 point scale going from no pain at all to this is the worst that I've ever felt in my entire life. Um, or star ratings, um, one star, two star, three star type things might be a categorical scale if you aren't allowing things like three and a half stars. Um, and, and so I thought we would, you know, sort of look at a few examples of these to give some ideas to people and encourage their use. And so the first is um, an example of Apple prices, Apple the fruit, not the company. Um, and so we have data here that I don't remember exactly where it came from that we acquired. Um, and we have a nominal scale along the x-axis. So it's what is the type of apple? Is it a red delicious? Is it a honey crisp? Um, you know, is it Granny Smith? What? And this is just a nominal scale. There's no order to it. Um, you know, they're not being displayed alphabetically. They're not being displayed, you know, by average price or anything. It's just here are seven different types of apples that you might see at a grocery store. Um, the vertical axis is an ordinal scale. And so these numbers basically represent roughly the size of the apple. Um, so I think this is, you know, there are roughly 56 apples in, I forget what, you know, volume of measurement they use for that. Um, so these are relatively big apples because you don't have a lot of them in the, you know, in the crate. And these are smaller apples because you have more of them. And so that's an ordinal scale. These are going from small, uh, sorry, smaller apples to larger apples. And the difference in how you deal with them is really not that much. Um, the main difference at the moment is that if you know you have a nominal scale, you can just say this axis, this scaling function is a nominal scale. I'm going to put automatic in the first argument and it's just going to go through and anytime it sees something new, it will say, oh, there's Granny Smith. That must be another item in my nominal scale. I'm just going to add it to the list and 
um, create an axis, you know, included on the axes and as part of the scaling function. Whereas the ordinal scale, because there is an order, you have to specify what the categories are. And that is simultaneously specifying what the order is um, for that ordinal scale. Um, the next example I'm going to look at is similar in that we have um, a nominal scale on the x-axis again, and it has an ordinal scale on the y-axis. And this is S&P bond ratings for um, each of the states as of sometime last year. I'm wondering if the data actually got updated earlier this year. So that might be a little bit out of date um, in the labeling of that iconized data. Um, and so here we have the states, and in this case, they're just listed alphabetically. There's no ordering implied there. And then we can see what the S&P bond rating for credit rating is for um, each of those states. And we're displaying this as a stylized list plot. And so, I mean, at the moment, nominal scale, ordinal scale, probably you're going to be looking at more the data visualization functions, your list plots, bar charts, um, bubble charts type of thing, rather than your plots and plot 3Ds. Um, but, you know, the, there may still be cases where you're plotting a discreetly valued function. Um, and, and so that may come into a nominal scale or something. Um, and so that is the advances we've made and changes we've made to scaling functions in the past year or so, give or take. Um, we're also going to now look at ternary list plot, which is typically used for looking at how of mixtures of things and particularly mixtures composed of three different types of components. And it uses some cleverness to take three numbers and display it as a 2D plot, as a 2D point. Um, and, and the trickery it uses, the cleverness, is that it treats them as percentages. And so, um, and I, I see we have questions. I'm. I, I want to get to them um, at the end. Um, and so I, I want to get through the primary material first. Um, and so the the cleverness that it uses is that it basically normalizes everything into percentages, and then you have a relationship that all three things add up to say one hundred percent. And that allows you to effectively remove a variable. Um, and so then, you know, even though you have a point here, you can read it off to um, what, what the constituent fractions are. Um, and, <clears throat> and the ternary list plots are not as familiar to everybody. And so it can take a little bit more time to get used to interpreting them and um, figuring out what they're what you're seeing when you look at one of these. Um, and, and so I have an example, a couple of examples I want to go through that show a couple of things that you can read off from a ternary list plot, from a ternary plot. Um, and so here I have, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. I thought I had, but um, so we have a ternary list plot, and the by construction, each of these sets of points corresponds to a fixed percentage of the value being A. Um, so if we take this blue set of points, this corresponds to mixtures where 70% of the mixture is A. Um, at this end, 30% of the mixture is B and 
uh, 0% of the mixture is uh, component C. And at this end, 30% of the mixture is C and zero of it is B. Um, and, and so you sort of have our A scale goes from zero to one and each of these is going to read off um, along this direction. We, these lines are, these points are covering up the grid lines and the corresponding to the A axis. These grid lines that are going, you know, sort of from this top left edge of the triangle down to the right correspond to C and the horizontal grid lines correspond to the B values. And so if I was to pick this point, then this is 60% B and 20% C and 20% A. Um, and so even though we have three values that we're looking at, because we know that everything adds up to one, we're still able to read off um, what the relative components are. We can't necessarily read off what the actual values were because there's no requirement in ternary list plot that all of the points actually add up to the same amount. Um, it could be that you know, one point of three numbers adds up to 10 and one of them adds up to 100 and one adds up to 75 or whatever. We're just looking at the distribution within each sample um, into the relative pro proportions of A, B, and C. Um, the other thing that we can look at is the ratio of points, of, of components. And so, Ooh, let's revive that real quick. Um, so I have an experimental thing turned on. So here, each of these sets of points um, is showing, it is a constant ratio of component B to component C. And so like if we take this point here, this is, um, about 35% um, C, and it is about 70% um, ish of B and uh, zero A. And so that should be, I think, in my green, which didn't get magnified, is my two to one ratio. Um, if I come down here to like you know, 0.2 there, I'm at. 0.55 and about 0.25 uh, if we trace um, back up to that point from there. Um, and, and so everything along here is sort of at a two to one ratio of B to C. Um, and unfortunately, the ticks don't reflect that in an easy way uh, quite so much, but um, if you have lines going into one of the vertices, then that is a fixed ratio. Um, and so next we'll look at some examples of this and um, it was really sort of interesting because, I mean, traditionally, I mean, the, the, the oldest versions of this type of plot that I know of are were basically color mixing. Um, more recently, it's come up a lot in geology and looking at soil, soil texture and soil uh, composition of uh, sand, clay, and silt. You know, to the point that the US uh, GS has you know, sort of named categories for different regions in this triangle, um, which we've recreated here. Um, and, and so, and then the way that we've created it is a point that I wanted to point out is that I have a polygon. So like this orange polygon in the middle here, um, I'm, I'm giving the relative, um, the, you know, the, the triples that correspond to each of these corners. And then it is automatically transforming that polygon from um, a polygon that looks like it should be a 3D thing to a thing that will display in 2D 
uh, in this and then you know so on for all the other polygons um they're just iconized away to um because they're not that interesting um so other things that you know you might look at are what are the you know in terms of nutrition what is the fraction of a food or a diet that comes from where your calories come from fat uh carbohydrates or proteins and so here we have a bunch of foods from Wolfram Alpha um, for which we're looking at their um, components. And so down here we have everything that is, um, so this is going along the fat scale and let's see. So obviously this has protein. These are all the zero carb things, right? So zero carbs is here, the horizontal line. Um, all this axis is zero carbs. And so we have basically different types of meat um, sprinkled throughout. Um, and then, you know, a seasoning here that I think probably is zero all the way around for everything. And so it's sort of an outlier. Um, but so you know, for dieting purposes, you might be looking at these sorts of things. And then I forgot to change the style on that. But the other one is that I thought was an interesting thing to look at was where different countries get their um, electricity from, what the source is. Uh, is it coming from renewable green energy? Is it coming from nuclear? Uh, or is it coming from fossil fuels? And so the bottom axis here is basically all the countries that have no, none of their energy coming from uh, nuclear. Um, and then we have, say, France up here, which has um, almost 80% of their power coming from nuclear energy. Um, and then, you know, countries that Sweden and Switzerland that have a lot of their energy coming from renewable sources, uh, including. Um, Zambia, which I can't get the tooltip to come up. There we go. Um, which is almost entirely renewables. Um, and in that case, it's hydro, um, hydropower that they're using for their electricity uh, in that country. Um, and so the last thing I want to look at briefly is drop shadowing, which was a new 2D style directive that was added in 13.1 which draws a primitive with a drop shadow underneath it. Um, and this is a style that can be used anywhere that styles can normally be used um, in 2D graphics, whether it's plot style to um, you know, style these curves so that they have a little shadow and look like they lift off the page a little bit, um, or you know, say in a pie chart um where um you know we get a little shadow under each of the sectors and i've popped this one out because of you know there's one of these sectors always has to draw on top and it's going to draw its drop shadow on top of everything else and so i popped it out to um hide that fact sort of um and, and so I think it'll be interesting, you know, to see what people do with drop shadowing and how they use it in plots and graphics and um, whatnot. And so now I'm going to switch over to see what we have question wise. Um, let's see. So for the scaling of um, infinite scales, so this slide. <clears throat> All right, so how is the infinite scaling done? So it is, I mean, obviously plot is still sampling at 
the finite set of points. Um, I don't remember. Um, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you can do um, an infinite type scale. Um, and, and so Sander was you know, wondering whether it was uh, Arctan, and I think it's not. I think it's actually, um, we, we have the ability to do it with Arctan. Um, and you could write your own scaling function that did it with Arctan as well. Um, but I think it's actually using whatever, you know, it's, it's somewhat arbitrary. Um, It's a rational-ish function that actually, um, you know, that we're actually using. But um, you know, depending on what function you use, it sort of affects, you know, how fast the transitions are um, in terms of, you know, this middle section and how steep these curves are. And so we picked one that we thought looked, you know, sort of nice, that it wasn't too sharp of a corner uh, going through the S shape. Uh, let's see. Right. So I, I think this question got asked in an earlier session. Um, and, you know, it, it's how to do large plot, you know, plots with lots of points uh, faster. Um, you know, so like 10 million points. And um, the best way is to not do plots with 10 million points. Um, and the, let me see if I drop to the end. Oops. Get some space here. Um, that took a little bit of time. I'm not sure why. I wonder if I had an enter key stuck or something. Um, or actually, it was just how I was uh, entering things. And, and so this takes. Uh -huh. Actually, I'm going to create a new notebook and then I don't have to deal with the presentation notebook doing weird things sometimes. Ten thousand, let's do a hundred thousand. Okay, so that took a little bit of time. I'm just gonna do it again just to make sure that we didn't have any initialization stuff happening. Um yeah, so for a plot like this, you don't really need all Hundred thousand points, um, and so if we include max plot points and we drop this down to like a hundred, then we get a very you know a curve that looks pretty much the same at a much faster speed, and so um, I mean in general, list you know the viz functions if you give them ten million points, they're going to process the ten million points. Um, and some of the stuff, you know, 
I'm, I'm sure there are places where we can improve speed with large data sets and it's something we look into um, periodically. Um, but the, the best approach really is to try to avoid using 10 million data points for uh, things. Um, and because if you do a list plot with 10 million points, we're going to generate a graphic with 10 million points. The front end is going to render it with 10 million points um, because we don't know that you know all the points aren't necessary or that they don't all um, you know, end up looking smooth. And, and you know, so sort of, it doesn't know where to throw away points, and so it you know sort of has to deal with all of them. Um, Right. Um, you know, I mean, and you know, as somebody else is commenting, 10 million points is silly because there's not 10 million points here. I mean, even, you know, I mean, I guess you get into, you know, you're getting close to 10 million points with some displays these days, but you know, your entire chart isn't, I mean, your entire plot isn't going to use it. Um, and, and so you can use max plot points or other techniques to, uh, trim things down, that will help. Um, and let's see. Da, 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 da. There's several questions about or comments about user interface that I'm not going to get into because it's not my area. Um, and I'm not the best person to speak about that. But um, when are we going to modernize charts? Uh, look, look like they're from 2005. Um, it, it's coming up. Um, I, I think we're collecting ideas on things that we want to improve stylistically on a lot of the visualization functions. Um, it hasn't quite hit a critical mass of ideas and concepts and improvements we want to uh, make a big jump on things. But um, I mean, there are definitely things stylistically and there's things functionality wise for all the different plots and charts that um, are coming up and I can't really speak about them in you know any specificity, specificity uh, right now, but um, if you have specific comments on ways that you think things could be improved, we're happy to hear them. Um, you know, a lot of times there's, you know, a little thing here and a little thing there and you build it up and then you have a, you know, something that looks significantly different um, just by an accumulation of small changes. Um, and so... I th we're about at the end of our time. Um, let's see. Commenting something that's broken, which I don't recognize it immediately. So take this plot plot range goes from that to that. Oh, that's cute. Um, I don't recognize that one, so I don't know um, what's going on there, why we aren't getting values on the left here off the top of my head. Um, so we'll, we'll look at that. I mean, that's, I mean, date ticks are, I think, an area that, you know, one of those areas that's rich for development and modernization, but, um, that's you know, just a straight up bug. So um, thanks for drawing my attention to it. Um, thank you everybody for joining me uh, today. And we will have more of these talks uh, get scheduled for next month. I don't remember if we actually, I guess next week is next month. So, but I don't know what the schedule is. 